Today I'll be talking about a new tool that I just open sourced called Runway, and it's a new tool for distributed systems design. I'll get into what that means, but I'm pretty excited about it because I think that is a blind spot for the community. Um, so I'm first going to talk about why we need new tools for distributed system design. Then I'll give an overview of Runway and go into some demos. And then I'll talk about building a runway model, how you can do this yourself. So I have to start with distributed systems are hard. Um, you know, I've been working on them for a few years now, and they're just, they tend to be hard to understand and hard to communicate about. Well, why is that? Well, you've got these machines spread across a network, and they're all acting at the same time. So you've got this natural concurrency built in. You have message delays, where by the time you receive a message, it's already stale. The information you're getting, the best information you can possibly have, is no longer the state of the world. You have to deal with failures, and these can come at any inopportune time. You have to deal with failures during failures. So it's not like you're writing an exception handler and you're done you have to totally change the way you think about your program. Uh, together, this causes many possible interleavings of events where it's really hard to say, well, I'm going to do this and then that. No, a whole bunch of other stuff could happen in between. And we tend to have little visibility into our running distributed systems and poor debugging environments to understand what's going wrong. So, as Redbeard pointed out, uh, I, I did do Raft along with my PhD advisor back at Stanford. Um, and that's not what this talk is about, but it does motivate this work, and I do use Raft in many of my examples. So real quick, I want to give a little bit of background on that. Uh, Raft is a fault-tolerant consensus algorithm. Hopefully you've heard of it by now. Uh, it's pretty widely used. It's used in etcd by CoreOS. Uh, they were one of the very early adopters of Raft. Um, and it, it really does motivate this work because as I was working on it, I wish I had some of the tools that I'm working on now in Runway. So a quick summary of Raft. Uh, it's kind of split into two parts. First is leader election, where the the cluster uses a majority voting algorithm to elect a leader, and there's randomized timeouts there that'll come up later in the talk. And then once you've got a leader during normal operation, that leader just replicates its log out to other servers. These are called followers. Okay. So here's an example of a really difficult bug in Raft try to motivate why distributed systems are hard, if anyone here doesn't believe me already. Um, so this is a bug in the commitment protocol in an earlier version of Raft, where the story, you don't have to get all the details, but the story kind of goes like this. That top server, server one, was leader, and it started replicating that yellow entry. Then it crashed. That bottom server became leader. It created this entry, the blue one. It crashed. The top server became leader again. It continued to replicate that yellow entry. And here's where, in the earlier version of Raft, that would have been marked committed. Well, what can go wrong is that bottom server could become leader again and then overwrite the yellow entry with the blue entry, and that would violate the guarantees that Raft provides. So that's pretty hard to spot. I mean, this takes, like, Three, serve, three failures in a row, you have to have this flip-flop between leaders and, and you have to have all these events interleaved. Like, this is hard to find. It got through a round of peer review where, where nobody spotted it. Um, and, and the point here is, like, when you're designing these systems, you can't think about one failure deep. You really have to think through, like, general, you know, very difficult scenarios. Um, is this going to work all the time? So, as a community, what do we do to find issues in our design? Well, we kind of do all this stuff on the left-hand side, like code reviews, 
tests for very first, unit tests, randomized tests. Um, and, and this stuff is really too late for the design process. So, so these techniques, they work for finding implementation bugs. That is, I was trying to write the correct code, but in fact, what came out in, the, in my text editor was buggy. So we do some testing, we find that bug, and to change that, to fix that, it's relatively cheap. You know, fix a few lines of code, and then we're done. But if you find a design error, this could be way more expensive. Uh, it, you know, it, it just so happened that the bug in the last slide, the RAF commitment one, that took one if statement. But another design error might cause you to have to refactor your entire program, rewrite the whole thing, maybe. Uh, and it can spread. You think you have a design error here, it, you change it, that might have unforeseen consequences for the rest of your program. So that's expensive. That's too expensive. I think we really need to focus on finding these design problems sooner before we're writing any of our production code. So to be really clear on this, um, you know, if, if we're going to have a real design phase, I think these are the goals that we should have. So communication and evaluation. We want other people to be able to build intuition quickly about the design. We want to communicate about it unambiguously and precisely. And we want this to be reviewable. So we want to talk about the major issues that came up, the decisions we made, and consider different alternatives. On the evaluation side, we want to make sure our designs are as simple as possible, because I think that's the only way we can possibly get them right. Correctness. You know, we don't want bad things to happen. That one's pretty obvious. Uh, performance, availability, scalability. These are all things we care about and things that we should evaluate well before we go and write our production code. But what are the tools we use today? We've got whiteboards, back of the envelope calculations, maybe design docs. They might include some pseudocode. That's really not enough. I mean, whiteboards are awesome, but like this is step one. Um, we're, we're not getting to the unambiguous communication. We're not really evaluating correctness, performance, or availability. It's really not enough. And yet, uh, pretty much in industry, this is what we do, right? So what else could we be doing? Well, we could be doing visualizations. That really helps communicate things, build intuition quickly. We could doing, be doing specifications for that really precise, unambiguous communication. Model checking, where a computer program will go and explore the state space for your design and tell you if it's possible to enter a bad state. And simulation, where we can answer questions about performance and availability. Under certain assumptions, sure, it might not turn out to be true, but at least we can make an educated guess about whether our design is correct. So what do these things have in common? Well, they all rely on these system models. A model is a representation of a system that captures its essential components and omits irrelevant details. So like here's... Uh, visualization of Raft called Raftscope that I did. Uh, you've probably seen it if you've seen any of my Raft talks. And this, you know, it's very clear to see that we have a system model here. Like, the network is flat. These messages just go directly from one server to another. Um, we're not worried about things like writing to disk. Uh, we, there's not even clients represented in the system. Just client requests just appear. But we're focusing on the stuff that really matters here. You know, the left side for leader election, what really matters is being able to see those timeouts, that's the circumference of the circle, and being able to see when messages arrive that reset those timeouts. On the right side, when we're talking about log replication, it's really helpful to see the logs just lined up so you can easily compare them, see which prefixes are equal, that kind of thing. But this idea of modeling extends to all of these things. So specification. You know, if you have too much detail in your spec, you're trying to 
just dump production code into a file and call it a specification, that's not reviewable, right? That has too much detail. That's the same thing as doing a code review. You need to get things down to the essential concepts. Model checking, if you have too much detail in there, it's not going to terminate. You know, it's going to be too slow. Uh, simulation, arguable, but you know, give, given the same level of detail you have in a system model, I think simulation can produce useful results. So now let me talk about runway. And the idea of runway is to combine those four things into one useful tool. Uh, this is open source, but it's still very early. So I'm trying to get the code out there. Um, you know, it, it is showing signs of usefulness, but I want input from the community. You know, does this work for the problem you care about? What would need to change? That kind of thing. So here's kind of a, an overview of Runway. You, you feed it a specification, and that's executable code that Runway understands. So uh, Runway reads that in and runs it through a randomized simulator. And that produces an execution or a history or a schedule, uh, all equivalent, where you're basically saying, you know, at this point, server two receives something. Then server three processes something. Then server one sends something. And that execution gets fed into a visualization. And visualizations are going to look different for different models, so you do have to provide it with a view file describing how to show things on the screen. Now, you can take that same visualization, you can interact with it so that you're m manipulating the execution. You can also run a longer simulation or run a whole bunch of simulations to create a whole bunch of executions. That'll create data that you can graph. You can then zoom into that data and watch the individual individual visualization to kind of understand it. And the other thing you can do is you can take this same model and run it through a model checker, and that's going to brute force explore the state space. If it finds an error that is a state that your code, your model should never have gotten to, then it's going to give you an execution of exactly how you got there, and we can show that visually so that you don't have to dig through a log file. So the key idea here is we're integrating all of this stuff into one tool. So you write one model, and you get a whole bunch of benefits in being able to communicate about your code, being, sorry, being able to communicate about your design through the visualization, through the spec that's unambiguous, and being able to evaluate your design for correctness in the model checker, and for performance and availability, scalability in the simulator. So I'll go into a few demos now. I've got three models I want to show you. The too many bananas model, it's a very important problem. Uh, an elevator system, and of course, raft. So here's my coworker, Bill, to introduce the too many bananas problem. He actually encountered this in real life. I like to eat bananas. So the other day, when I noticed I was down to just one, I went to the store and I got six more. And that was a good number of bananas. But later that night, my wife, who'd also noticed I was down to one banana, came home with six more bananas. And that's just way too many bananas. I don't think I could eat that many before they go bad. All right, so, so this is a very important problem. It affects the number of bananas wasted on the planet every day. Um, oops. So I, let's see, I just got this running. Uh, the domain is runway.systems if you want to follow along at home. Cool. Uh, and let me load up, let me start with the broken too many bananas model. And this is, this is basically reproducing the, uh, the issue that Bill was describing. So I've got a house here, five roommates. Um, I'm going to just 
click on one of those, they're all happy right now, but that one's sad. That means it's actually just hungry. But, you know, how do you draw that? So, that person eats a banana and then they go happy again. And maybe this person gets hungry. They eat a banana, they're happy again. But now, there's no bananas left at home, so they have to go to the store and bring some back. And Bill's problem was describing, well, what if two people go to the store at the same time? They might bring home too many bananas. So I've set up an invariant in this model that says uh, we should never have more than eight bananas at home. That gets to be wasteful. And I can just run a random simulation. We can watch it. I'll speed, speed it up a little bit. And pretty quickly, we're probably going to see that, oh no. Ah, uh, there we go. So that, that might have been a little fast, but uh, I, if my timeline hadn't resized itself, I could probably, yep. So we can, we can slow it down and we can watch that happen. So we, we had all these bananas at home, but actually these people are coming from the store with more. That's going to be a problem. Okay. Luckily, uh, you know, I, I I have been thinking about distributed and concurrent problems for a while, and I believe I've solved this problem. I think I've solved the race condition. So here's the correct, or what I propose is the correct version of the model. That, you know, just like before, when you're hungry, you have to go to the store, but you actually leave a note now. You just pin it to the front of your house. It says, I've gone to the store. And the rules of the model say that if someone's gone to the store, no one else is allowed to head out. They just sit there waiting for bananas to arrive. So we can run this, run it for a long time. Um, it's not going to find an error. Okay. So, but uh, we'll, we'll get into the model code for this one a little later. It's about 40 to 50 lines of code, uh, plus the view, which you know, isn't terribly complicated. So this one, this is a bit more fun. Uh, it's around 450 lines of code. This is the elevators model. So it's modeling an elevator system. Uh, we have a nine-story building, six elevator banks. These people on the right, uh, Z means that they're sleeping, and a number means that this is where that person wants to go. And so they call the elevator, they get on it, they take trips. Uh, those little dots in the elevator shaft represent where the elevator plans to stop. So uh, this model, by the way, it's, it's not optimal. You know, you could, you could definitely route the elevators better and pull requests are welcome. Um, but it does pretty accurately model the elevators in my building, which uh, suck. <laughs> So we can kind of um, show you a couple more of the features. We can hover over an elevator and take a look at its internal state, or we can hover over a person, figure out um, its internal state. And this is pretty useful for debugging when you're trying to understand uh, why is my model behaving the way it is. You can also scroll down on the page. Um, not sure you can read all of that, but this is just a giant raw dump of all the state in the model. So it's uh, people at the top, there's five of them. You know, the first two are riding an elevator, third one's sleeping, the last two are waiting for an elevator. Uh, floor controls are the little buttons that light up on each floor um, when you request an elevator. And then the elevators are yeah, they're at a floor, they're between a floor, the doors might be open, closed, opening, closing, etc. Uh, and another thing we can do, so here I've got a graph, and this is showing all of the trips that have been taken so far in this simulation. So the blue part is people, how long people had to wait for the elevator to arrive, and then the orange part is how long they spent riding that elevator. And I can click this simulate button, oops, and that tells 
There's a worker thread in the background that's just going off and running the simulation. And we're not, uh, you know, we're not keeping up with, with it visually because that's just a little too fast. Um, but we're building up some good data points here. Like, at this point, you know, we, see, we see a spike here. This person had a pretty bad elevator ride. Well, why is that? Why did it take them 100 seconds? Totally typical in my building, by the way. Um, so I clicked on that bar, and scrolling up to the top, it actually jumped my timeline back to when that elevator ride occurred. And it's highlighting the elevator that person was riding in, and the person's highlighted they're going to the eighth floor. So they just got on at floor one. We already see they're about to stop at floor three, and they have to head all the way to eighth, which is, you know, a relatively far ride. We can just watch this happen. Like, oh look, they had a bonus person get on, so they have to open the doors again. They have to stop at the second floor, pick someone up. Stop at the third floor. Drop someone off. This is a pretty bad ride. Drop someone off. And finally, they get to the eighth floor. So yeah, um, you know, if, if you were really trying to optimize this, you could watch a few of these rides and maybe get some ideas of, uh, well, maybe that wasn't the right elevator to pick up that person and take them to the second floor because it really screwed over this rider. That kind of thing. And the third one I've got, Raft, of course. Uh, if you've seen Raft Scope, this probably looks pretty familiar, but uh, it is a, I don't know, new code base. Um, so here we're, we're watching a leader election take place. Uh, wasn't a particularly clean one, but server three became leader. And the cool thing about this one is I can interact with it, so I can, uh, you know, shut down a server. And you see what happened here on the timeline? I actually forked the state of the world. So I'm no longer following that first simulation that was, a, it was already, you know, a little bit ahead of where we were displaying. I'm now on this simulation. And I can do that again. Like, let me just have that server time out. And if I screwed up, I can actually go back. I go all the way back. Right, so now, in this state of the world, I never killed that server three. It's still up, it's still leader. So that's kind of nifty. Um, let's see, for fear of uh, my live demo screwing up, I'm gonna reload that page. <laughs> and now I've got a similar graph here similar to how the elevators worked, but this is actually graphing the election time. And that, um, so we had, we had one election, took about 150 milliseconds, and now we've got a stable leader. But I'll just shut it down. Now we see the second election was a little faster. Well, I can come over here and I set up a magic variable called reset stable leader. I'll just change that to true. And so now when I, when I run the simulation, what the model is doing is any time a leader, oh, and I have to, I have to kill it. Um, so any time a leader comes up now, the simulation, it's got a rule that's just automatically gonna kill that leader. So there we got a leader, killed the leader, restarted the whole thing, and now we're doing it again. Okay, and so this way we can, we can run that in the background and generate a whole bunch of elections really quickly. It's pretty similar to what was going on with the elevator rides, right? Well, that one's bad enough. So we can go and try to figure out why this election took a while. Pretty sure this will be a split vote. 
So yeah, four servers timed out at just about the same time. No one got any more votes, or no one got enough votes. And then it got resolved the next time around. So that, that actually wasn't even that bad. Um, you know, 270 milliseconds. Okay. Oh, and by the way, the raft model was about 700 lines of code in the model uh, and about that many lines for the view as well. Uh, and I didn't even show the, but you can create log entries, they get replicated, you yeah, know, it pretty much works. Okay. So, so what, what is the key idea here? Simulation's not new, visualization's not new, but Runway, I think, is the first tool to really put all these things together. So imagine the world where you're trying, you know, like I did with Raft, you're trying to do simulation, model checking, specification, you're trying to do all these things, but you need to write completely independent models using independent and quirky tools. So you're writing similar models for all these different tools, and if you change your mind about the design, you have to update them all. And t in, so for Raft, you know, there's a 500 line TLA model that serves as the spec and was once useful for model checking. There's the JavaScript visualization where the Raft part of that is 300 lines of code. There's a simulation for leader election written in Rust version 0 0.8, so I don't really suggest looking at it. Um, that's 500 lines of code. And there's some pseudocode. It's more compact, 150 lines of code, but of course, it's probably broken because it's pseudocode and I can't run it at all. So now I'm at reimagine that with Runway, where we just reuse the same model. So that lowers the cost of developing this and it gives you all these additional benefits. So maybe we can justify doing that sooner in the design phase. You know, all this stuff for Raft, I did after having production code. So I really didn't get as much value out of it as I should have. The other thing is, if we're writing one model and we're using it in all these different ways, we're more likely to find bugs in it. Like, if you're just writing a one-off simulation and all it does is it outputs a number that you decide is good or bad, what if it's buggy? You know, you have no idea. But if you're taking that same thing and you're also visualizing it, you're also model checking it, that should help your confidence. So, and, and the other thing is specification, simulation, metal, model checking, they all benefit from visualization. So if you're writing your spec, having that visualization there gives you a debugger. Um, you can watch the state go you know, you can watch an elevator fly off your screen and that might make you think about whether it did the right thing. Simulation, uh, you, you saw how when we generated these graphs, we can really dig into them and understand what's going on better because we can watch individual ex executions. And model checking, if you have an error, just load it up into the visualization to understand how it got there. Okay, so the last section of my talk is on building a runway model. It takes a couple of things. The specification, which describes what state there is and how it changes, and the view, which takes the state and describes how to draw it on the screen. So the specification, uh, you know, it's, it's in a new language that I'm going to present on the next few slides. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's what you should be worried about. The view, this is, it's just code, right? We, it serves a function of showing what's going on. If it's broken, it's pretty easy to tell why because you compare your, your view to the state variables being dumped out and you see where the difference is and you fix it. Um, so the view's just built on JavaScript and SVG. I like to use the D3 library for generating the SVG because it makes a few things easier. But, you know, this is probably not where you're going to be spending a lot of mental cycles. It might, it takes time, it's tedious, but it's not hard code. Okay, so 
how do, you, how do you actually build these two things? Well, I, I'd recommend taking this approach, which might not be entirely obvious. Um, first, you want to sketch that view by hand, because writing some, you know, drawing on a whiteboard or on some graph paper is a lot easier than drawing in JavaScript. So you, you want to identify the basic design elements. You want to figure out your basic layout by hand. And given that, you should be able to, um, you, you, you can see like, well, to support having this elevator object, I'm going to need an elevator type. It's going to need these state variables so that I can visually show whether the doors are open or closed, opening, closing. Um, so from that, you can define your types and your state variables. And then you can create a view based on that sketch and using those state variables. And just manipulate the state variables however you need to toy around with your view to make sure it's sort of correct. And then I'd say write invariants for those state variables. So these are properties that must always hold. And if you somehow uh, violate the invariants, Runway is going to report that right away. So you can just catch bugs in your state really early. And finally, write those transition rules describing how the state changes. And you can start with some unrealistic transition rules like, oh, server wants to become leader, it's already leader, and fill in more details as you go. Uh, you can skip intermediate steps and then break up your rules into multiple rules, that kind of thing. And, what, and, a, and a tip here is, you know, set a convenient starting state for whatever part of the model you're working on. If you're, if you're working on log replication in Raft, for example, then don't bother with, like, going through the whole leader election process. Just make server one be the leader, and then you can get to what you want to work on quickly. So what does the specification language look like? Well, first thing to point out is that it is code, code that's interpreted by Runway. Um, but it's not the same, you know, you're not writing Go, sorry. You're not writing production, you're not writing in a production programming language. It's a much more limited environment because we're trying to leave out a lot of unnecessary features. So you define a starting state, you define transition rules, and you define invariants that are properties on your state. Uh, this is called a labeled transition system, but it's you know, pretty much a state machine. So rules encode the behavior of how your state gets from A to B. They also include encode failures. So like in Raft, I have a rule to drop a message, a rule to stop a server, a rule to duplicate a message. These are, these are the types of failures that Raft is supposed to deal with and even given these failures, those invariants are meant to hold. Um, applying a rule is atomic, so the interpreter just applies one rule at a time. And you're not always going to be able to apply every rule. So I can apply a rule all the time, like stopping a server, well, if it's not already stopped, but I can't really drop a message if there's no message to drop. I can't send a request vote if I'm not a candidate. So you just add if statements within all of your rules describing your conditions. And then a rule is called active if applying it would change the state. And if you don't satisfy the conditions, don't change any state, the rule's inactive. If you've got multiple rules that are active, then the system decides which one to take. So in the simulator, you know, we're making these random choices to show one particular execution. But in a model checker, you want to explore all possible paths to see if any of them might lead you to a bad state. And so that's going to kind of fork and walk the tree. So this, this thing, this labeled transition system, this is really good for modeling distributed systems because, as I said before, failures and other events can happen at really unpredictable times. And so if I define that rule that says stop my server, I'm not saying when that happens. That could happen in between any possible interleaving of events. 
that's up to the system to decide, right? Um, and then if the strong type system, the invariants, these help make sure we're not making silly mistakes. So here's, I've got the too many bananas code split across two slides. Uh, this is the correct version of the model with a note. So here I'm showing the state variables. Well, I'm way over on time, huh? I'll jump through this really quickly. So, you know, I've got a banana, so it's an integer, a note's a boolean, and a person, this is, uh, could be happy, hungry, going to the store, returning from the store. If you're coming back from the store, you have some number of bananas, and the system ensures that you can't access that if you're not coming back from the store. There's that invariant over on the right, so if we don't have more than eight bananas. And then this model just has one transition rule. Um, so if you're happy, you go hungry. If you're hungry, there's no bananas, there's no note, then you go to the store. If there are bananas, you just eat one and you're happy again. If you go to the store, you come back from the store with a random number of bananas. And if you come back from the store, you add your bananas to what you've got at home, you remove the note, you go hungry, and you're probably going to pick up a banana shortly but I wanted to allow other roommates to eat that too. Okay, so hopefully not too scary. Um, you know, not, not exactly what we're used to, but it looks like code. I'll skip that. So to summarize, I think we really need to apply tools to help us design distributed systems. You know, we, we need to be able to communicate our designs, we need to be able to really understand our designs and their limitations, and we should be doing that before we write any production code, because that stuff's expensive to write and expensive to change. Modeling helps us focus our attention on concepts and leave out unimportant details. So it's a really powerful tool that we, wanna re we want to leverage in the design phase. And we, we want to focus on things like failures that really matter to our distributed systems and not things like programming on a single machine that we're pretty good at and we'll probably get right, at least after some testing. So Runway is a new tool. It's open source. Hope you check it out. Uh, it combines specification, model checking, simulation, and interactive visualization into one tool. And I think even though as a community we weren't necessarily doing all of these things before, maybe if they're packaged into one tool and they build on each other, maybe that's a good reason to actually start doing these things and to start doing them in the design phase. And I don't mean this to be like an academic thing. I want to start doing this in industry. You know, I'm, I'm at Salesforce now, we're applying this internally. It's still early, I mean, you, you saw the state the tool is in, but it's already useful. So, go look at the models, build your own, help develop Runway. There's definitely a whole lot left to do. And I'll leave you with this, just solve design problems in the design phase. Thank you. <laughs>